welcome to Access Control, taking a break from crypto and getting a bit into uh, other aspects on how we can use uh, security primitives to orchestrate access to individual resources. First off, uh, I have a short announcement to make. Um, we're gonna do a little switcheroo, which is a bit unfortunate, um, also because it's happening twice. Uh, so let me try to explain because it's a bit complicated. Um, we'll have to do a little bit of switching around due to logistics. And we're gonna, the, we're gonna make sure that this, uh, this actually is somewhat, uh, somewhat beneficial for you as well. So this Wednesday, um, instead of next Monday, we're gonna have the class on data security and PAIC um, in the largest lecture room, the INJ218. In addition, we're gonna stream it on Zoom for those that wanna be online. If you want it to be interactive, please come to, the, uh, to INJ218. Otherwise, there's gonna be the Zoom uh, for those that wanna follow online and the recording for those that just wanna watch the recording. Now, it's a bit unfortunate, so instead of next Monday, we're gonna have it this Wednesday. Uh, next Monday, we're gonna have the quiz um, and the exercises for um, the access control part and the, the data security part, which are somewhat connected. So it made sense for us to actually combine the exercise sessions so that we have a joint exercise session between the two parts, thereby getting a bit uh, the best of both worlds. And then the Wednesday next week, we're gonna do the class on PL security, programming languages security, to make sure that we can, uh, we can realign. But then on the 14th, there's not, uh, there's not gonna be class. Uh, but then on the 16th, which is in two weeks, uh, before the holiday, we're gonna do the exercises for OX15. Now, I think what changes is we're, we're moving the Monday lecture twice to Wednesday for two weeks in a row because of uh, interesting logistics, um, which gives you on one hand the benefit that the exercises for OX03, the access control and OX14, data security are gonna be joined together so you can practice together uh, and ask questions there. And you've got one week without, uh, where you don't have to stay on Wednesday. This may also be used as a dry run to see if the classes are better on Wednesday afternoon than on Monday. Um, because on Wednesday, classes or the, the exercise sessions are from one to four, versus here they are from four to seven. And my gut feeling tells me that the uh, concentration is better on uh, between one and four than between four and seven. Um, so this is just gonna happen twice uh, based on the schedule. So this Wednesday, we're gonna have class for data security and PAIC. And um, next week on Wednesday, we're gonna have the PL security. When you're writing the, in the, the evaluation, please bring up if, uh, if you prefer Wednesday over Monday as well so that we have some data on that. Question. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, I will get there. Uh, good question, very good question. Like the question from the student's perspective is what does this mean for the quiz which will be next week? Um, we're gonna have the quiz next week uh, for classes one, two, and three. Um, so excluding the data security that will be covered this Wednesday, including what has been taught two weeks ago, last week, and what will be taught today, including the exercises from last week, uh, from two weeks ago and last week, and no, sorry, from last week, and from uh, for this week, we have released the sheets, and the solutions will be released on Wednesday as well. Uh, we're not gonna ask any practical questions about uh, what will be covered right before the, the quiz. So no practical aspects of access control and whatnot. 
Um, now, it is also, I use this as an opportunity to bring up a question. Um, you can decide, and we're going to do a simple vote. There's two options. Uh, either we do the uh, exercise session, the joint exercise session for two hours, and then the quiz at 6.30, or we do the quiz at quarter past four, and then the exercises. Um, we live in a democracy, like except for deciding on what grade we give, um, because then it would be slightly skewed, uh, because everybody would be voting for six. But we, are, we live in a de democracy where uh, you can decide if you want to do the exercise session first and then a quiz at 6.30, or the quiz at 4.15 and then the exercises for next Monday. So, show of hands, um, who would like to do the exercise session first and then a quiz? One, two, okay, around 10. Who wants to do the other way around? Okay, <laughs> that's why you didn't count. Good, uh, that's what I expected. So we're gonna do the quiz first, 4.15, and then the exercise session afterwards. Um, for the quiz, as a reminder, there's no extra material allowed. Uh, bring a blue or black pen, not a pencil. Uh, the quiz will be in a multiple choice format uh, of 15 minutes. We're gonna release the seating assignment before. Um, you can come in when the doors open and do the quiz when we start. You get 15 minutes, no extra material. We'll collect the, the quiz material afterwards and then be, uh, be done. Questions? Yes, please. So the quiz is next Monday. No, sorry. The quiz is next Monday, correct. Um, yes. On Wednesday, where will the lecture be? Where INJ 218. <laughs> I will also send an announcement on, on either a Moodle or an ad. I'll have to see to make sure that people actually know. Other questions? Going once, going twice. Um, the reason for the switches, if you want uh, to know from my perspective, um, next week is the last lecture of my PhD advisor and I have to travel there. Not a choice in date for me. It was just on Monday. The, in two weeks, uh, I will be in Salt Lake City for one of our top tier conferences to present two papers. Um, so yeah, that's the reason for the traveling. And as, uh, as lecturers, we are asked or we have to uh, kind of balance research work and teaching work to some extent, so if you're interested in that. Um, if you're interested in the papers for two weeks from now, you can check them out on our homepage. One is about fuzzing, which we'll cover later today as well. Uh, not today, later in the course as well. The other one is around memory safety and enforcing memory safety, which will also be a part of the course. So two fun research topics that continue attracting interest at, uh, at top tier venues. Um, cool, if there are no more questions, let's dive into the, uh, the material for today's class. First learning goals. The first learning goal is just to know how authentication works and what authentication factors are, like passwords, device, uh, different devices, biometrics, different advantages and disadvantages. Um, along with being able to differentiate and identify access control policies. After authentication, we look into authorization, such as role-based access control, discretionary access control, and mandatory access control. You will learn these acronyms and then be able to differentiate between them. And also understanding the value of authentication protocols and different kind of uh, delegated authentication that you can use. We're gonna break this into like three major parts. I'm gonna start with auth authentication, which pretty much is the science of verifying someone's or something's identity, as in we figure out who you are, right? And then based on knowing the identity of somebody, we can decide if they get access to something, right? But the first question is usually the question about identity. So authentication is, is the process of verifying someone's or something's identity. Like you can, you prove to some extent to 
some other entity that you are whom you claim you are. So identification is the act of identifying a particular user, often through, for example, a username. For example, I can say, hey, I'm user Matthias, uh, and then the computer says, show me the proof. Like, I, don't, I don't let everybody log in, and then I usually type my password, uh, and then the system uh, authenticates me as the given user. So I'm proving my identity to the system, which pretty much already demonstrates you the oldest form of authentication towards other computing systems. So password-based authentication is the simplest form of authentication. It's very easy to implement. Uh, user can send both a username and a password to the server, and then the server authenticates the user's identity. So on a client, user enters the name and the password, sends it over the network, uh, to the server, the server then decides, um, um, uses the, the password to authenticate the user's identity and then authorizes in step four access for some, for some um, aspect that the user wants. Now, if you think about this most simple form of authentication, what happens if the network is compromised? What are the, the different attack, or let, let's take a step back, right? What, what, what are the different attack vectors? Oh, I already leaked this, but. We can spend a minute on discussing. Yeah? If the network is compromised, then a malicious entity could take the password and freely log in from themselves? Okay. Yes. So somebody with network access could record the, the, the password um, that is being sent and then use this to log in. Um, do you know what this is called? So it's, a, it's somewhat related. Hmm? Yeah, it's a form of a replay attack where you record and replay the password, and that means that it's vulnerable to a replay attack, right? Because you can replay the same password again and again for different actions. Cool, so man in the middle or somebody sitting on the network can uh, record the, the password, that's, that's one issue, um, which already tells us one of the weaknesses of password-based authentication, right? It's not, it's not enough uh, to just send the password, but we will have to verify that this is actually secured. Um, what are other attack vectors that you can come up with? Yeah? The password is too weak, then we can guess it. The password is too weak, and we could guess it. Yes, that's one angle. Um, so the, there can be brute force attacks, depending on the the, the implementation of the, the password policy. Yeah. That really depends on the password policy that is being enforced. Um, very good point. I don't cover this here on the slides, but I should add it for next year. Thank you. Um, there's a, sometimes when you're creating slides, you're blind to some of the obvious aspects. Um, what else? I'm hoping for somebody else, I see your hand. I'll give them 10 more seconds and then I'll take you. Yes? Denial of service, sure. Yeah. What else can be compromised apart from the network? Uh huh. Yeah? What could happen on the server side? Um, if, uh, if the passwords are um, like plain text, we can just grab them and then choose them and then uh, compromise. Yep. So the, the server, correct. The server may be compromised as well. If the server stores your passwords in plain text, an attacker may be able to get access to the, to the plain text password and then use it for authentication to, for example, other services or whatnot, right? So there, there's trade-offs for using passwords, right? It's, uh, um, there are risks, and uh, we've already learned that we have to be careful on, uh, over the network. We also have to be careful uh, regarding storing passwords, especially on the server, if ma many passwords are being aggregated. And we've also received a hint that, hey, we need to be careful regarding password policies. 
Now, maybe uh, I'll, I'll use this hint as another, as another note of something I don't have on the slides. Uh, creating good passwords is really, really hard. And um, it really depends on, like, uh, for us humans, it's very hard to remember hundreds or thousands of passwords for all the different websites, and we need to be careful in how to, uh, to create those. Um, we'll discuss some of these aspects in a, in a bit. Uh, for example, using password managers, so this is on the slides, but there's an interesting policy here regarding password changes. Um, so you have to change your EPFL passwords repeatedly, right? Who remembers that? The others were not around before, so only about 10, uh, 10 users uh, or 10, 10 students raise their hands for the, for the recording. Now, EPFL enforced a password change policy so that uh, everybody had to change a password every six months. Um, from a user perspective, this is pretty much the, um, let me think how blunt I can be, uh, the most unuseful thing you can do. Because if you force password changes without the compromise, um, the users get trained to change their passwords. They will usually use weaker passwords when they change their password, uh, re resulting in reduced security, or even reuse passwords across multiple sites, uh, resulting in, in other weaknesses. Now, um, it was my, my personal battle to fight against the EPFL administration for two years to abolish the mandatory password change policy uh, in some very long and very frustrating meetings, at least from my end. Um, so that was a, a bit of a, of a surprising measure. The EPFL decided that they had so many vulnerabilities in some of the subsystems that they wanted to force password, uh, password changes on a repeated level to make sure that they can at least reduce the amount of um, fallout that they, that they cost. Um, yes, it's, a, it's never a good strategy. Um, the, you can claim that you're doing something, but the something that you're doing is not security. Uh, the only thing that works for security is actually fixing the underlying vulnerabilities, especially in your identity management system, and then um, not forcing password changes except for if accounts are being compromised. Interestingly, there's a, like the, the, there, there's a, just last week there was a new recommendation by NIST, the, the security standard, to not change passwords. So the, the, the NIST usually gives recommendations on what you should do. They very rarely give recommendations on what you should not do. It's usually, you should do A, B, and C, and then if you follow this, everything is fine. They extremely rarely give you a recommendation, you shall not, because that's a, that's a very harsh uh, counter, counter uh, approach. Uh, for passwords, they opted last week to actually give out this recommendation that you shall not force repeated password changes. So this was an interesting, uh, interesting move. And I, I gleefully sent an email to some of the involved parties uh, pointing them to this, uh, to this recent, uh, recent change, uh, which was a fun, uh, fun experience. I haven't heard back, back yet. Uh, but yeah. The, as you can imagine, it doesn't make sense to force password changes due to like, users reusing their passwords and just getting, getting weaker and weaker um, and whatnot. Question? We'll get there. Password managers are the solution. Like in my personal opinion, don't remember your password for every single website, but just ask the, the password manager. And uh, this also protects you against phishing. If your password manager doesn't autofill in a form, you're not on the right website, even if it looks like you're the website that you think you're looking at. If you, have, if you use a password manager, then it makes sense to change the, pass, the, the, the password for every website every six months, because then you use generated passwords and you don't have why does it make to ch sense to change? You need to go through the work. Like, it's an interesting question. Like, can you bring this? Uh, 
I, I have slides for password manager and, and you're, we are kind of precluding the discussion on password managers because not everybody knows password managers yet. Um, I'm wondering, let, let's do a very quick discussion on this because it's, it's, an, it's an interesting point, right? So the, the, the argument was if you are using a password manager, you can update the passwords every six months because the password manager handles this anyway and stores the passwords. Um, now, it's true that the, the password manager stores all auto-generated passwords, which is good, right? It uh, creates the maximum entropy for your passwords, limits re or restricts or prohibits reuse of passwords. Um, great, right? Now, why, should, why again should you renew the passwords every six months? Like, this is extra work, even with a password manager. Does the human need to do that, or should there be a protocol somewhere in the background that auto renews? Well, protocol is always good, but uh, as, a, as a user, it's it could be important to do it if, I don't know, someone just see your password somehow and just use it, or someone spies on it. How would I see your password somehow? I don't know, if, you're, if, you, if you see it on the network, maybe, uh, maybe you intercept it, or... So if somebody potentially sees your password on the network, yeah. you would roll over and renew the passwords of all the users. No, I mean, uh, so let me, like, you're, 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 it's an interesting, interesting train of thought, right? Your argument is that there could be a potential compromise of some accounts, yeah. therefore we need to renew the passwords for all accounts. So I give you numbers, maybe 10 accounts are compromised. There are 6 billion accounts that need to be changed. Is it worth the cost to change all the passwords? Because pa changing passwords comes as a cost. And in my argument with the EPFL administration, I showed that in three years, we burned of the time for changing the passwords, we burned through one life of work. So across the EPFL campus, over the last three years, we spent one work life. Like, changing passwords comes at a cost, right? This is insane. Like, if you just spend 10 minutes changing the passwords, and if you sum this up across the campus, it's one, there was one work life, right? So, so changing passwords is not for free. And you have to, if you're working with security, you also have to consider the cost. So, assuming there's some accounts that are compromised, do you roll over all accounts? Okay, but if you have like 10 users that are compromised, maybe the cost is greater than one, uh, one lifetime for the, of work, because 10 user compromise can be a huge cost. So it depends on the users, yeah. right? So we just forced the 10 admins right. to change their passwords and not everybody else. Which makes this much more nuanced. It's a, it's a great discussion, right? If you think about it, and for, for, uh, for, these, uh, for these sys admins, sure, it makes sense to, uh, to go through high security. And usually they don't change their passwords. They go through like five second factor things where everything are single use tokens, which makes much more sense in this case, right? So that you cannot even reuse it in the first place. So it doesn't make sense, the point being, as part of this discussion, it doesn't make sense to roll over passwords, except if you have a clear indication of compromise. And this could be, for example, you see that the accounts are being used, um, like somebody is logging in with your password while you have an access token here and from like five other locations somewhere else in the world. Right? If you see that there's different, different the logins are coming from different networks and whatnot, you want to trigger a password change and lock the account. Right? So it makes sense to be a bit more reactive to limit the cost that you are, you're incurring. But just telling all of your users you need to change your passwords now, this is a very high cost operation. Right? Even if it's only 10 minutes for each individual user. If you sum this up, this, it's not for free. We had other questions. Cool. So this was a bit out of order. Um, think of this as we are doing a UDP lecture, not a TCP lecture. Um, so we'll, we'll resynchronize as, uh, as, we, as we go along. But this was a, this was a good discussion. Thank you for, for bringing this up. Um, and it's also making uh, making your class much more interesting if you, if you continue discussing like this. So cool authentication factors, right? We now know that passwords are not perfect, and we've already discussed a bit some of the, the uh, aspects. Um, now, 
access control, if you think about it, why would you want to authenticate? Uh, access control only makes sense if the subjects are authenticated, because after authenticating uh, a subject, we can decide what to do, right? Like uh, what we want to give access to. If, um, um, if, if everything is publicly available, you don't need to authenticate, right? Because everybody can access the same information anyway. Uh, there's three different flavors to authenticate subjects. Either I can ask you something you know, such as a password or a pin code. Uh, I can ask for something you own, such as a, like a, a number on a paper card that you get, uh, like a, having access to a smartphone, your smartphone, a certificate that you have, an electronic token or whatnot. Uh, or I can ask about something you are. Like I can look at your fingerprints, I can look at your, your iris, and uh, like other kind of biometrics. Um, and then two-factor uh, two authentication requires the use of at least two factors. Usually a password is one of those two factors, but it could be access to your email account and a PIN number, or access to your, uh, to your uh, email account and this, this two-factor, uh, uh, like an authentication token or whatnot. And then if you combine the two factors, it's much less likely that an attacker compromises two factors. So for example, for, for passwords, even if your password is compromised, the attacker may not be able to get your, your second factor and the electronic token lined up at the, same, uh, at the same time. Cool? Now, I told you already that the password is very, very old. And uh, people have agreed that the password is just dead. Right, we're, no long, we're, we're soon no longer going to use the password. They just don't meet the challenge for anything you really want to secure. Within five years, you'll never need a password again. Passwords are done at Google. Right, these were statements. Now, the statements were 20 years ago, right? Last time I checked, we're still using passwords. The flip side of this discussion is that like, passwords are surprisingly simple, right? They're extremely cheap to implement, they're extremely cheap to, to maintain, um, very low cost, uh, very easy workflows, and um, like, you don't need to train users. Like, we have all learned what passwords are and how they work. Um, it's very easy to actually follow up on that, right? No other single technology matches their combination of cost, immediacy, and convenience, right? So simple to use, and therefore, we're really, very likely going to stick with them for a while. Now, passwords are not a panacea. They, uh, even, uh, even strong passwords are at risk. Stolen passwords can be replayed by anybody. Right, we've already brought this up in the discussion very early on over the, the network, right? Replay attacks are a thing for passwords. If an attacker can record your password or gets access to your password, they can um, reuse it anywhere else. So steal passwords, for example, using client-side malware on your system, obtain the passwords by crashing, cracking hashes stolen from a server, that's going to be the next lecture. Um, also, this already assumes that the passwords on the server are hashed, which is a best practice. Uh, unfortunately, not always happening. Um, the, an attacker could fish passwords with a fake website where you're being sent to, uh, or even eavesdrop, eavesdrop the, the password, as we, as we mentioned before. Um, and remember, from last week, this is why we need TLS. Now, there's so-called credential stuffing attacks that you may have read, up, uh, read about, where there's lists of usernames and passwords distributed online. Uh, there's lists with passwords or commonly used passwords from different leaks that are being combined. Um, and then you can try, uh, or an attacker may try to, uh, the same credentials on many different websites. Because commonly users reuse their passwords. And oftentimes, your username is your email, right? So if, you know, if I know your email and a bunch of passwords you use, uh, I can try these passwords on other, other websites. Um, now, interestingly, the, when different websites were hacked, uh, we saw that users often used the same passwords even across websites. 
right? So both Sony and Gawker were hacked, and two-thirds of people with accounts at both sites reused their password. Now, if one site gets hacked, the attackers can immediately log in to the other site, or used to be able to log in to the other site. That's one of the reasons why nowadays we're rolling out second factors and all these additional security measures uh, with single, single use tokens being sent to your email and whatnot to actually pro protect against these uh, password reuse attacks. So password reuse attacks are a thing. Um, don't reuse passwords across websites. Uh, that's just not a, not a good idea. Not just because your password will be leaked, but because uh, the average website is programmed by a drunk monkey uh, who will make lots of mistakes and therefore your password will leak. So be careful and make sure that this actually, uh, that you have unique passwords for each site, even for throwaway accounts. Now, this is where password managers come in that uh, we already discussed and brought up. Now we're getting our uh, packets back in, in sync. Uh, password manager stores all credentials in an encrypted form, or hopefully in an encrypted form. And a password manager uh, allows you to store an individual password for each account that you use, and then just use these, uh, these, these passwords and autofill the, the login forms, for example, somewhere on the web. Uh, your master password is used to decrypt the credentials, and then it can be used on different devices, uh, different systems and whatnot, for example, your smartphone and your laptop, or your smartphone, laptop, and desktop, or wherever you are. Um, and uh, this is also is an interesting phishing protection, right? Now, if you go to a website of your bank, or a website that looks like the website of your bank, if the password manager does not autofill, that's a very clear indication that something is fishy. So I'm, I'm, a big, I'm personally a big fan of, like if you, if you need to give advice to your parents, tell them to use a password manager so that they don't reuse the passwords and tell them if the passwords are not auto-filled, this is not the website you wanna click next on, right? So it's a very simple advice that's very digestible by the average user and helps them increase their, their security quite a bit. And they only need to remember one single password. Um, now, one of the questions for password managers is where passwords are being stored. Uh, this could be offline, for example, for, for KeyPass uh, as, a, as a local file. Um, you can host this, this file somewhere else if you want to on your own. Uh, the password manager talks to a server in the cloud, such as LastPass, uh, with a browser plugin or whatnot, but then you're already trusting uh, the service to some extent because you're, you're outsourcing the password verification somewhere else. Or um, you can use something like Bitwarden where the password manager comes as an open source server that you can host anywhere you want, even on your, on your own system. Cool, so password managers are great. They allow you to multiplex, to some extent, uh, passwords. Now, um, after logging in a web application, the server usually sends you a cookie, which is stored in a client. Now, if you remember your network uh, classes or server uh, classes, the, this usually allows you to store some information on a client. You should not store username and password on a client, but what usually is stored is an authentication token, and with this token, the client can authenticate themselves or itself against the server again later. And the session token is valid for a certain amount of time, and during this time frame, you don't need to log in again. And uh, the server just remembers, hey, client with this authentication token was authenticated to this user and can then use this as a back and forth. Uh, the cookie must be unique for each subject and can be used um, by, the, by the client as long as it, uh, as it is valid. Now, this also means that if an attacker gets hold of these authentication token, they will not have to crack your username and password. They only have to take uh, the, to get, the, get hold of your token. And with the token, they can log into your, uh, your system with this authentication token. And this has become a very common attack vector, right? Or a hack to some extent. So, um, like, uh, uh, an attack by 
an adversary that gets code execution on your system will scan your browser cache uh, for any authentication tokens and then use those to log into the different websites, right? So stealing authentication tokens is a pretty big, uh, big thing at the moment. Uh, it can also be used as a benefit, right? For example, when I was writing bots for Slack, uh, usually steal your own authentication token so that you can send messages, right? So uh, the, you, you need to find your, your Slack authentication token to actually allow your bot to send messages on your behalf, um, which means that your bot has the same uh, privileges that you have. Um, so if you want, uh, it's an actually a nice exercise to go check out your, your browser cache uh, to see what different tokens are around and how these tokens look like and then maybe um, hack up a little Python script to interface with um, different web pages and claim that you're authenticated to as a certain, certain user. Cool, so that much about authentication and session cookies. Um, now talking about the different factors. Like, we already have the, the password, something you know, right? The password or PIN. Uh, we, in addition to that, there's something you own. Uh, they're typically, typically called hardware or software tokens. Um, could be a bingo card. Like a, a bingo card, like on the, on the top, um, top right. Has anybody used bingo cards for authentication? One. Really just one, two? Just two, four, cool. How does it work? Anyone who dares speaking up? The, the website asks you for, well, it gives you a coordinate, and it asks you what is on the card and what's actually on the website. Yeah, so the, the, which means that the, the website stores the same bingo card, and with this bingo card, they just ask you, hey, give me X and Y, you give the number uh, the, on, the, on the position X and Y, and um, you, can, uh, you can then use this to log in. Um, and then you use a random allocation to walk through all the different, different codes um, to, use up, uh, to use them up, and you send the user a new card when about 80% of the tokens are being used. Right? So they can refresh and have a, a new bingo card. Um, why would you order this in an XY grid, in a two-dimensional grid? Yeah? How would this be easier to use? Yeah, if I have a list and a number, that would be the same, right? Give me number 256. Yeah, it's the same in terms of situation. So you can also use the same as a cross off list, but this, it's, it looks a bit nicer, right? So with the two dimension, you can, uh, you can access it in a bit, uh, like it, the access is a bit easier overall. Um, cool. Uh, you can also use a one-time password, uh, like a OTP token. These are these, these little hardware devices you press on it and then it just displays a, a number and you use this as your OTP token. Uh, can be used once, password changes with each time or click. Now there's a trade-off between either it rotates every 60 seconds or it, uh, there's a new one each click. And start thinking about what the, the trade-offs are between the two, between time or click. Uh, proofs that the user owns the token at the time of login and cannot be copied easily because this is secure hardware. There's also a standard out there for this, for this authentication. Uh, another thing, something you own, tan generator, it could be a calculator where you plug in your, your bank card and then it's being used with crypto on the bank card to authenticate and prove that you own the, the bank card at the same time uh, and just gives you a visual interface of the, uh, of the bank card. So you're using the secure hardware on your MasterCard or whatnot to actually calculate the secure number for, to, to log in into your online banking. Uh, most of us will be using our smartphones at this point of time where we just have all the different accounts in um, um, like OTP software uh, such as the, the Google Authenticator. 
something else we own. Uh, there could be like a, a UB key or something like that, uh, where we have a token, such as a uh, my token hanging over there, so if you want to log in and seal my second factor, uh, EPFL is providing great security by forcing me to leave my key at the entrance where anybody can seal it when they run out, uh, out of the room. Um, so my second factor is hanging there if you want to, uh, to log in on my behalf. Uh, but it's usually like a small little hardware device where you need to press uh, and then uh, authenticate the use of this, this system. One last thing, there's a, a general standard called uh, OATH, uh, an open authentication standard, and we'll dive a bit more into detail after the break. Um, very cool now for a heavy context switch after the Women Plus, Plus and the Forum uh, announcements, we're gonna go back to uh, OATH. Uh, another fun topic um, along all of them. Um, OATH is a standard that describes how different kind of one-time passwords should be generated from a seed, and it's a kind of an XML format for, for, for importing the seeds into an authentication server. Um, also for giving you a bit of, uh, of detail into how this, this actually is all encoded. Um, you can also play with this to some extent if you look at exports from the Google Authenticator and whatnot to uh, play with different kind of, uh, of formats and understanding them. Uh, standard OATH tokens exist in both hardware or software form, as in the Google Authenticator app. Who's using the Google Authenticator app? Everybody. Who has exported your one-time passwords? Who has, uh, like, so we're, we're down from 95% to about 2%. Um, for, of those who have exported their uh, one-time passwords who have decoded them. We're down to 1%. Um, out of those that have decoded them, what, what did you do? But you decoded it and then imported it? Yeah. Why, why did you decode it? Or did you just dump the, the export file into your password manager? Oh, so you need the, the secret and then import the secret in the password manager. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and then you can automate things, right? Um, I did something similar for the, the EPFL VPN, um, having to enter the OTP token 400 times a day gets kind of annoying um, because uh, EPFL is not in favor of storing uh, session tokens uh, and forces users to re-authenticate for every little thing, um, which is so annoying that uh, as, a, as a hacker you get around security, right? So it's also an interesting lesson for you when you're designing security. Security should not be annoying. If you annoy the users, they will find ways around your security and thereby weaken your security. So designing security comes at a cost, and especially authentication comes at a cost. If your authentication system is too annoying, people will find ways around it. So yeah. Uh, now how does this OATH actually work? So there's either counter-based or time-based. Counter-based uh, HOTP, like to create a, uh, a one-time password, is uh, you take a seed and a counter, you concatenate, you run it through HMAC SHA-512, which is why we had the class last week, so you now know what it is, and then you trunk it and turn it into a number. Okay, so you take the first 16, 32 bits, 10 digits or six digits or four digits, depending on what you want, uh, here, this is six digits. Um, the trunket function is the first, uh, first six digits. Um, and you just, as a function, you just use the counter. Uh, you concatenate the secret and the counter, HMAC, trunket, and this is your number. And this is exactly what you're entering on the websites, what the, um, what the Google Authenticator app actually creates. Um, if you see this, what's your key question? for the counter-based? 
Yeah. Yes, excellent. How does the server know what the counter is? Or let me, let me rephrase your answer a bit. How does the server and the client keep the counter synchronized? Right, because this turns into a synchronization question. Uh, the, the, because the counter actually, like uh, every time you press, you're incrementing the counter. And very likely on the client, you're incrementing the counter. So an interesting question here is the, the counter, um, like the, the counter synchronization. Uh, that's also why there's a time-based uh, one-time password where uh, we're just using the counter-based, but the counter becomes the current time, right? So instead of using a counter that we have to synchronize, we're just using the current time. Um, because it would be annoying to change the, 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 the one-time password each, each second, or each millisecond if you want to, right? We are um, synchronizing it over a time frame. So the time interval X, which is usually 60 seconds, so the counter becomes like how many 60 second intervals have happened since, I don't know, uh, December 1st, 1969. Um, which is a, uh, a common uh, common time to start. So this gives you a, a very clear counter. Now, what are trade-offs? Like, uh, when would you use counter-based, when would you use time-based? And what are advantages or disadvantages of both? We already had the issue of synchronizing uh, the counters for the counter-based one. Um, what's an issue for the time interval one? What do you think? Yeah? Everybody knows it. Everybody knows your counter. Sure. Is this bad? They don't know the secret. Right? So if you, if you would be hiding a, um, a second factor in the second factor, maybe, Right, if, if you would rely both on the secrecy of the counter and the, 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 the secret key, then yes. But we would be assuming that the, the key is the, the secret value. But yeah, that, that's a point. It's an interesting point. Didn't think of that. What else? For time you have to recalculate the OCD every interval. Yes. When what's bad about this? You have to recalculate the OTP every interval. It's once every 60 seconds, it's pretty much free. I, I think that's not, not an issue. But um, yes, you have to, uh, but you would do the same for the, for the, um, for the counter-based. Like you would do the same amount of operations compared to the counter-based. Like you're only calculating this when you log in, right? So, and you would likely hit it, uh, the, the window at the right time. Yeah? For hardware-based tokens, keeping the time can be difficult? Keeping the time can be difficult, yes, that's correct. Yes, so um, you turn the, the challenge of synchronizing the counter into a challenge of keeping a hardware device, uh, like having a good enough clock on the hardware device. This is why these uh, hardware tokens are usually fairly expensive, and they come with a built-in battery and a fixed duration. So they usually last for two years, and there, there's a good enough clock in there that doesn't have more than a couple of seconds drift over two years or three years or for however long this token is valid. Uh, and two to three second drift, that's okay because users are usually like, we are, we, we, users are usually working on the order of seconds, not milliseconds. So having a couple of seconds drift is okay because the system has to cope with that anyway because users are, are slow at typing. But yeah, you have to organize and ensure that there's not, not more drift than a couple of seconds. Cool, what else? Yeah? Oh, this is the counter-based one, so I look at the device, I put in the token, I have to regenerate it when I want to log in, and it's only valid for that login. Correct. <clears throat> well, maybe then the time-based one is, uh, I mean, it's difficult, but if it's, it's, uh, not, it's worth for 30 seconds, it's valid, or 60, so 
Yes, replay attacks. That's one of the big weaknesses of, of time-based counters. Exactly. Yep. So a, count, uh, a token is usually valid for 60 days. Uh, 60 seconds, sorry, not 60 days. Uh, 60 days would be a tad long. Um, so a token is valid for 60 seconds. And it can be replayed over these 60 seconds. Yeah, that's an issue. Um, so yes, the, the time-based one is valid for a certain time. Um, you have to protect against drift, you have to protect against replay attacks. Now for the counter-based one, you have to synchronize and make sure that like if, there, if there's an attack, how do you resynchronize, right? The protocol gets more complex. That's why most uh, systems have now moved to time-based because it's much easier to synchronize time than to synchronize the, the counters. That's why I would guess all the one-time passwords that you are using are time-based. Um, things like RSA secure IDs, they are an example of uh, time-based one-time passwords using a very precise clock, uh, and they regenerate every couple of, uh, every 60 seconds or so. And you see a counter on the, on the left side for how long this is still valid. You had a question. Let's say you're standing here, you're opening your authenticator. I see your token uh, and then I can reuse it. Or there, there's some other way like uh, we are in a Zoom meeting, you're on camera, you are multitasking, logging in on a second, uh, second screen, but uh, you know, the camera catches your one-time password as you're typing it or I get some other access to your one-time password, right? Then I could reuse it. Or like I, I have compromised your, uh, your system and I can, uh, I can steal your, uh, I can record you typing and uh, see both the one-time password and the password that is being used. Make sense? Cool, other questions? So yeah, RSA secure IDs were an example of such uh, time-based one-time passwords. And um, attackers stole all seeds from RSA, which was a very cool uh, supply chain attack that happened a couple of years back, um, involving the information stored on CDs being stolen and other interesting aspects. So I've, I've left a link here if you want to read up on it. And it's, a, it's an interesting supply chain attack that compromised all RSA devices that were uh, publicly available at the time. Uh, likely by some state actor, but then attribution is hard. Um, universal second factor is then a standard that kind of orchestrates how you authenticate. Like this is a, a mechanism to create the one-time password. Universal second factor is a protocol to uh, negotiate and, uh, and discuss, uh, agree on a password. For each application, a token generates a key pair and then gives the public key to the server. On login, the server sends a random challenge to the client. Um, you'll see with a lot of these security protocol, it's always a random challenge being sent to the client. The client then signs the challenge uh, plus the domain name of the server plus the signature counter, thereby combining the name of the server, the challenge, and the counter like uh, making sure that the, this, this remains synchronized, sends the data and signature to the server and server verifies the signature using the count, their counter information, uh, checking the signature of the, the server and whatnot and everything else. Um, adding the domain prevents phishing attacks, right? So this protects against phishing attacks. Uh, adding the counter detects cloning of the private key and replay attacks because you keep track of how many times uh, a system has been used. And if you can no longer log in, it means the, the, uh, the counter is out of sync. Here in this protocol, we're using the counter to detect replay attacks, right? Whereas because the, the counter is being stored on the, on the client that you're sending. You're not pressing and increasing the counter each time you look at the, uh, at the, the, the token. Because here with uh, OTP, the issue is if you increment the counter each time you press, right, you're advancing the counter, 
but you may fail the login because of a timeout or you've mistyped the password or whatnot, right? And then it could already be out of sync. Cool? So the universal second factor device, we've got the client, we've got the server. The server sends the client uh, a challenge, handle an app application ID, the client checks the application ID and forwards it to the universal second factor device, the, including the challenge origin, channel and whatnot, uh, which is combined as the, the, the challenge. Uh, lookups, the, the, the universal second factor device looks up the, the associated key, increments the counter, uh, then uses the counter and signs, uh, sends the counter and the signature of the, the three values uh, along with the counter over to the client. The client forwards it to the server, and the server checks the information using the local stored information on their end. This is pretty much how universal second factor is implemented. This is uh, what is being done every time you authenticate using your YubiKey. Um, who's using YubiKeys or other universal second factor keys for their, their authentication? Oh, the same three as before, <laughs> four or five. Okay, very few. Uh, this will likely become much more common, especially when you're logging into uh, to other services. It's a nice way to authenticate you and uh, give you additional additional protections. Let's also less cumbersome than typing six numbers each time. You just plug it in, you press the button to uh, ensure there's a human in front, and then you're you're good to go. Uh, it's something that you own, right? You own the UB key, and it's a it's a great second factor. Uh, an extension of uh, of this is. Um, uh, FIDO2, which standardizes this universal second factor, and it can also be used over the, the web, which is then called web auth. Um, makes use of uh, the client to authentication protocol to synchronize between the, the different parts. Authenticator can be USB token, smartphone, or authentication module or whatnot. Very cool. Uh, so there's different kind of advantages. No problem if the server gets hacked. It's an asymmetric system. Information stored on the server ca cannot be used to log in. It can only be used to, to authenticate you. Uh, no problem if the client gets hacked because the private key stays in the secure hardware of the client. Uh, the key is only possible with user interaction because you need to press on the, on the little device. Um, and it's super, super convenient compared to other one-time passwords. If I go back a couple of slides to show you the device, uh, what I actually like is, like here, um, where's the button? Like if you plug this in, this is really, really tiny, right? It hides in your USB, uh, USB device. Where's the button to authenticate that you're, you're actually there? Is this the device that you have? Cool, where's the button? Yeah, say, where's the button? It's basically, if you plug it in, you have that small golden part on the right that still sticks out of the USB port, so you touch it there, it's a sensitive... Uh, yeah, it discharges because uh, like you're being, a couple of electrons throw, uh, flow into you and you're good to go, right? So it, it, it measures the discharge. Very cool, right? So it's a very nice way to implement the button and to detect humans. So it's not a physical button where you press, right? You don't do any physical force, uh, but you can measure it being touched. Um, if you move on to biometrics, biometrics is something that you are, um, something you know could be guessed, something you own could be stolen. Uh, with biometrics, there's nothing to remember, nothing that can be lost. Um, it could be like uh, psychological, like your iris, your retina, your fingerprints, the shape of your head, uh, the shape of your hand or whatnot. There's many different things. But also behavioral, your speech patterns. Your speech patterns are very unique to you. Uh, keystroke timing, or like if you're interacting with a, a tablet, like how you're moving uh, on, on the screen, how you're swiping. Like just swiping left, swiping right is a unique pattern that allows you to authenticate you, right? Uh, it's a very unique pattern on where you or how you move your finger over the screen to detect what the, uh, what the swiping gesture is. And with slight differences, you can authenticate individual users. 
Um, the gait is another one, like how you move, how you behave or whatnot. These are all biometric biometrics that can be used uh, to authenticate you potentially. Now, um, biometrics consists of several steps. First, you need to acquire the information, extracting characteristics, characteristics, then store all of these characteristics. Now, one of the big difficulties here is that humans are not precise. They change, they adapt, and they're not always the same. So there's a, there's a, like a, a range here. Um, so for authentication, you first need to acquire the information, and then you need to figure out a way to compare and then decide if this is a true comparison or not. Um, acquisition is never exact because this is a, like you're, you're measuring a biological process. Comparison is never a perfect match. Uh, like the, the biometric information cannot be hashed. It's very hard to compare. And the decision is therefore always error prone. Um, so usually like we, we need to figure out the, the different error rates. So the decision algorithm must accept a certain error uh, and the sensitivity can be tuned carefully between accepting too much or accepting too little. So there's a false acceptance rate. The system declares a match when it isn't. Uh, there's the false rejection rate. The system declares a non-match, although it was a match. And there's uh, when the two curves meet, this is where we define the equal error rate. Uh, and it's usually the best, best point for you to decide. Now, uh, at the x-axis, you see the sensitivity, and on the y-axis, you see the, the percentage of, uh, of matches. Now, you want to, to hit and decide exactly, you want to set the sen sensitivity for your sensor exactly where this, uh, these two curves meet to get the best possible, possible outcome. Um, and as you know, even with your fingerprint sensor, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, right? So it's not 100%. This is exactly one of the, the reasons why uh, yeah, the, the, how this, this system is set up. So we are accepting some failures to make sure that we can actually distinguish between individuals. It shouldn't always allow people to log in, right? It should be effective, but also it shouldn't be too annoying. You, like if you have to press 20 times each time you try to log in, uh, that's usually not, uh, not interesting for you. Uh, if you look at fingerprint, fingerprints in particular, um, the fingerprint is read by the, by the sensor. Um, like if you, if you have a modern phone, the fingerprint is usually embedded under the screen. If you've ever checked how it works, is there's a strong light, a much stronger light under the fingerprint sensor, which shows up and then uh, measures the reflection of your finger thrown back at the, at the glass, which then kind of scans or takes a, a, a a very detailed picture of your fingerprint to extract the miniature to uh, figure out where the different ridges are, where they are terminated, where they split, and whatnot. And it sources this in a, uh, in a graph that says these are the different angles to other points, locations to other points, and whatnot. So the, essentially, your fingerprint is turned into a list of coordinates and angles and then compare to stored list, adjusting and tilting to get the, the, the closest match. And then if the sensitivity is lower than X, the comparison was successful. Right, this is how a fingerprint uh, sensor actually works. Cool. Um, face ID, uh, some of you may have Apple devices. A uh, quick show of hand of me, uh, for me, who's using uh, an iPhone? Who's using Android instead? Okay, we're, we're at about half-half, uh, which is a good representation of, the, uh, of Switzerland. Um, uh, Switzerland and US are about 50-50. Uh, rest of the world is about 90-10. Why is that? Exactly. All right, Android phones are cheaper. So if you're developing, Apps always consider the, the, the bias. Um, only Switzerland and the US have uh, about a 50-50 split. In all other markets, it's much more likely uh, an Android device. Now, Face ID, uh, the idea is pretty cool. Uh, you uh, project a set of dots onto, 
um, onto, the, onto the face and by then taking a picture on how the dots are shaped and uh, how they, they are spaced allows you to reconstruct a three-dimensional image uh, using just one camera, right? So it's a very cool vision trick to, get, uh, to go from 2D to 3D, and this is what Face ID uses to create a, a 3D, 3D image. Um, and then uh, it, it scans the image, compares it to the registered face. Uh, so there's a specialized and isolated processor. Uh, the main processor never sees this, this personal data uh, and whatnot. Uh, but as we know, in security, everything can be faked. Um, so this was a very cool art project uh, to get around Face ID by figuring out which features the system actually compares. And as it turns out, it's mostly around the eyes. And uh, if you build a, uh, a mannequin that's close enough, this will actually work out. Now for biometrics, like one of the, the challenges uh, for authentication are that the, the, you cannot hash them, right? Neither for transmission nor for storage, which means that you have to protect this data, right? There's a risk of theft. Um, as soon as uh, somebody has stolen your fingerprints or the, the 3D image data that you have, uh, an attacker could use it to compromise your systems, right? And log in on your behalf. So it's best to store the biometric data locally in protected hardware. And it's one of your reasons why your iPhones and Android devices uh, use two kind of operating systems. One operating system for the application and everything else, uh, like all the apps that you're running, and a second operating system for all your trusted data. Uh, interestingly, this is called uh, uh, the secure world and the normal world. So all your apps, including like uh, on Android, the, the Linux, uh, Linux kernel and everything else live in the normal world, whereas uh, in the secure world, there's all the trusted information, trusted applications that handle your, for example, your, your private keys, uh, key management, but also your biometric information. Uh, which means that even if your device is stolen, it's very challenging to extract the, uh, your fingerprint information because it's sitting on the, uh, on the trusted world, in the trusted world. Um, so yeah, um, the, there's, uh, you, you need special sensors for, for, for biometrics and whatnot, which makes them somewhat challenging for remote authentication. So therefore, if you want to use biometrics, use it locally uh, to, uh, to, to give access to an authentication key. Now, uh, biometric data is considered sensitive, and needs to be protected. That's why usually companies don't want to store it, which is good. Um, it should be that way. Uh, but it's also, there, there's different kind of privacy issues, right? For example, it can reveal health issues. Maybe your, your eyes are not that great, or you have different kind of, uh, like a, a disease in, uh, that shows in your, in your eyes. Uh, it can also exclude some people, right? It can be exclusive. What about uh, if you don't have fingerprints, right? There's people that are born without fingerprints. Or there's accidents, right? You may lose your finger. Uh, that's one hand, right? Uh, the, there's also the issue that, uh, like, as, as I said, right, you cannot change it. If it gets stolen, there's no way for you to recover that data because it is un, unchangeable to some extent. Um, so there's, uh, there's interesting aspects here on who should be allowed to take pictures of you to take your fingerprints and, and whatnot. There's, uh, for example, privacy fears as Tokyo tax, uh, like taxes in Tokyo used facial recognition to guess uh, age and gender for targeted advertisements, right? So there was this, this warning or, or this screen that showed up, which is, uh, yeah, not great. Uh, so you don't want to necessarily leak your private information everywhere on the internet, especially, or use it for advertising, right? You don't want targeted advertising if you're sitting in a cab and you have no choice of, um, or, or of, of opting out. But that aside, I think that covers the part where we're authenticating people, right? So authentication usually works best with multiple factors. 
uh, password can be one of them. Second factor, uh, like an OTP, can be the, the second part. Um, after authenticating individuals, we can uh, give them access to certain, uh, certain privileges or certain objects. So after we authenticate a subject, access control defines and enforces operations that subjects can do on objects. And access control only makes sense after authentication. If we don't authenticate, then everybody can do everything, right? So access control only makes sense after authentication. So both the subject, uh, uh, Bob, the subject has permissions to read, write from a socket. So this is the operation on an object and we have a subject. It implies that the subject has been authenticated first. Now access control is fairly old. Like it's one of the older, uh, older parts of, uh, the, of security. And the traditional idea is to define uh, security policy as a collection of access rights in a, in a matrix that defines the different, uh, different permissions and privileges. So access rights describe which subjects can do what operations on what objects. I highly recommend, uh, if you have a little bit of time, to read the linked article here. This is Butler Lampson, on, uh, a Turing Award winner on uh, authentication and authorization and defining these access control matrix, which was pretty much the foundation for all of these, uh, these security mechanisms going, uh, going forward. Um, and you see an example, a screenshot from the, from the slide, uh, sorry, from his, uh, from his paper here. Um, defining the different, uh, different areas. It's, a, it's an interesting read, even though the paper is a bit dated, it's still uh, valuable today and will give you interesting, uh, interesting information. So security mechanism, the security mechanism try to prevent operations that are not authorized by the security policy. Here we're introducing the difference between a policy which describes what you're allowed to do and a mechanism which is the enforcement mechanism that forces you to actually do so. So for example, the access implements an access check to see if a user has permissions to open, uh, open a file. If the access check fails, the rights are not granted, which means this is a mechanism because it actually enforces uh, a given policy. And the policy could be this access control policy for the file. Um, there's a generic policy where we have access permissions for files and a concrete policy that this file is owned by user X and user X has the rights to open, uh, read and write uh, this file. So difference between policy and mechanism. Now we also have principles, that's a, a general concept that we want to enforce and one of the important principles in um, for, for access, uh, access rights and access restrictions is uh, the principle of least privileges or POLP. Um, and the basic idea here is that subjects only have the minimum, requi minimum rights required for the job. Which means that um, if you take away one additional privilege or one additional um, access right, the policy would no, the, the system would no longer work or the, would no longer be able to achieve their, uh, its job. If you give additional rights, you wouldn't get more functionality, right? So principle of least privilege means if you take away anything else from the, from the allowed list, uh, you would lose functionality. If you would give anything else, no matter what, you would not gain functionality. So subjects are only allowed the minimal operations on objects per the given task. Um, now the challenge here is to have a system that is simple to implement and manage that is cl as close to the principle of least privilege as possible because uh, this also introduces complexity, right? Any security access control mechanism introduces complexity and you need to figure out uh, how this actually works and fits together. Um, and as I said, uh, principle of least privilege is the most important access control principle. Now, when we're looking at systems, uh, one of the challenges we're facing is that we have multiple levels of access control. 
there's multiple angles as well. There's network level access control, so we can give, we can create security policies at the level of, uh, of the network, looking at individual um, streams of data. Subjects could be connections going from one system to another, or even data packets. Uh, they are identified by source, destination, IP addresses, protocol ports. Enforcement could be done on routers uh, that are routing these packages back and forth. For example, uh, a data server can only, uh, only accept traffic from inside EPFL, uh, this given source address, connecting to TCP port 3306. Um, so for example, with the, the recent CUPS vulnerability that hopefully all of you have already patched, um, one of the options was to limit the UDP connections on port 631 to only uh, systems from, uh, from the same network or subnet. Um, typically enforced through, through network equipment, firewalls, server, uh, on, or the different, different servers, such as uh, the uncompli uh, uncomplicated firewall in Linux, UFW, and configuration on the server software. What are trade-offs uh, filtering at these different levels? Well, you can do this at, what, what's the trade-off between filtering at the firewall versus filtering at the server? Or at the router versus at the, uh, at the server? Sure. Yeah. The server has? Like tasks. tasks? Oh, you mean performance cost? Yeah. So yeah, the, the, the server may be overloaded with everything else. Yeah, that's one part. So uh, pushing this to the server makes, uh, increases the workload of the server. What else? There's a lot of maintenance. Maintenance between um, having to, to handle all the configurations in different places. You don't know if your package is passing, you don't know if it's because of firewall configuration or yeah, uh, so the, the com there, there's additional complexity, I would say, right? If you, if you handle this at the firewall, you need to configure the firewall and the server, and the, the two configurations may become out of sync. Anything else? Okay, yeah, the, but that's pretty much some of the, uh, some of the key, key differences. Now, like if, uh, as we already mentioned, right, these were just two, but there's many more confusing levels of access control. We can have access control at the operating system level, we can have access control at the application, or even within the enterprise. Um, not the, uh, the company, not the Starship. Uh, so access control at the operating system level, the question would be, what user should be able to start or stop the, the database engine? Right? We have different users that can log in to the system. Who can read, modify the files of the database? Right? The system administrator is, is allowed to read the files of the database. Access control in the application, right? So maybe the, the database server implements its own access control. So you can have different kind of users that can log into the database. And then again, have different, different privileges. So we have access control at the database level. Uh, we may even have access control at the application, at the client side, right? So the, which adds to the, to the, to the uh, restrictions. Um, or even at the, at the enterprise, on which employee is allowed to access which user account, which applications are limited to human resources, which ones to everyone. There's different approaches to, to access control, such as role-based access control, discretionary access control, and mandatory access control. Um, not message authentication code, by the way. So there's a, already one of the acronyms that are overloaded, uh, overloaded. MAC can be message authentication code if we're talking about crypto, or mandatory access control if we're talking about uh, access control. Um, Role-based access control works by assigning roles to users and kind of simplifies the specification of permissions by grouping all of this into different roles. Centered around uh, user roles, 
uh, with multiple permissions and whatnot. So for example, teacher can do this, this, and that. Uh, Non-editing teacher can do this and that. And it's pretty much the, uh, the matrix as defined for, um, for Moodle, uh, our beloved web, uh, web platform for course management. Now the different, uh, like I can, I'm the course administrator, I can assign teacher uh, privileges to the, to the TAs, we all have student privileges, we, and which then defines the operations you can do on different things. So RBAC simplifies management. Instead of having all the different rights on the X axis that we've seen on the previous screen, uh, and having the, a set of links to each user, what we do here is we have different roles, such as role one and role two, and then we assign to each user the roles that they are allowed to have. And they can still have multiple roles, but it kind of uh, adds one layer of indirection to make management much more feasible and scalable. Um, RBACs can be implemented at the level of operating systems, as in a notion of groups, as in, in Linux systems, Groups can be given a set of permissions, and users can be added to groups. For example, uh, my user here uh, is part of, the, uh, of my own group, which is my, like, what, whatever I decide to do. Uh, CD-ROM, I'm allowed to, to mount CD-ROMs and floppies. I'm allowed to do sudo. I'm allowed to work with audio files, video, like the, the graphic cards. I can plug in new devices. I can control network uh, and whatnot, and Bluetooth and maybe even use the scanner. Um, it's easy to grasp, the idea of roles, easy to manage. They decouple the, the digital entities from the permissions. Um, easy to revoke by removing the role, but typically and typically centrally managed. Downside is um, it's difficult to decide on the granularity of roles, like how deep should this be, how extensive should this be. Also, the, the meaning of a role is somewhat, somewhat fuzzy and, uh, and imprecise. Uh, also unclear if roles can be shared across different departments and whatnot. As for example, a manager role, is a finance IT manager the same as a marketing IT manager? What, the, what are the differences? So it may be hard to map it to, to enterprise practices. I see that nobody has stolen my YubiKey yet. Um, be aware that I'm a good runner. <laughs> if somebody tries, just be warned. Um, we've talked about role-based uh, access control in the past. Uh, one quick note, because the question came up three times in the break. Uh, the question was, why don't we just hash, why can't we hash uh, biometrics? Uh, the answer is that uh, hashing requires a precise match. So if you want to hash, we would need to be able to do a precise one-to-one -one comparison. For biometrics, we can't do one-to-one -one comparison because there's always gonna be imprecision in measuring, which means the hashes would be completely different. If one bit changes, the hash is gonna be different. Therefore, we cannot hash biometrics for comparison. Therefore, you would always have to store the full set of biometrics. Therefore, you want to make sure that this is stored somewhere locally on a protected, uh, protected part of your device. I hope that helps a bit with context and where and how to use uh, biometrics. Cool, uh, discretionary access control. Uh, so this, this is a form of access control where it is at the discretion of the object owner. The owner specifies the policies to access resources they, they own and the access control matrix represents these rules. So for example, we have uh, uh, student grades txt, homework one grade.sh and sensitive. Like student has read access to their, their grades. Uh, they can run the grade script for their, their homework. They don't have access to sensitive. Uh, TA1 has read and write access to grades, uh, can read, write, so modify the grade script and can run it, uh, and has read access to sensitive information. And maybe the prof has write access to uh, sensitive information as well. Now, there's this interesting trade-off between access control lists and capabilities, right? Think of a door protected by a bouncer versus a door protected by a lock. An access control list, think of the bouncer at a nightclub, right? The bouncer knows exactly who can get in, and they decide who gets in. 
So people don't know where they can get in and where they can't. Whereas for capabilities, the, it's like a key that is tied to a subject, right? The doors don't know who will show up with a key, right? There's gonna be the multiple copies of the key, but whoever has the key is allowed to access. People know exactly for which doors they have a key, and then they can use the key to open. An ACL is practical when you often have to create or modify rights on objects. Capabilities, on the other hand, when you often create or change rights of subjects or roles, right? So it's a different, uh, different perspective. That's also why uh, modern systems usually support both. Uh, so discretionary access control in Unix systems are typically done with access control lists, which means they're stored in the target object, such as in, in metadata of files in the file system. Um, so this is the, the bouncer, right? Um, students are grouped in three categories. Uh, subjects are grouped in three categories, owner, group, and other. Uh, and it's a classic Unix style access control list for discretionary access control. Uh, for directories, read means the directory can be listed. Write, the directory can be modified, such as you can create new files, delete, rename files, and whatnot. Uh, X means the directory can be accessed. Now in Unix or uh, terminology, everything is a file, which also explains how these access permissions map to directories. In the end, the directory is a file that just lists the different contents of the directory along with links on where it is with some additional access restrictions. Um, three writes and three groups are stored in nine bits for each file, uh, represented as three octal digits. There's owner, RWX, group, RX, others, read, which would mean uh, it's 754, seven, which means all the three bits are set. Um, for the group, only the read and X are set, and for the others, uh, only the read is set. Permissions of the first matching category dominate. Now, it's an interesting pitfall. Right, if others have more rights than owner or different rights than owner, you could lock yourself out from having access to a file. That's an interesting trade-off. Like if you change uh, a file to 077, everybody except you has access to the file, which is an interesting note on uh, a pot potential pitfall on, on this system. Um, ACLs in, uh, in Unix is an example. Remember that the, the, in, we mentioned the uncomplicated firewall before. There's a graphical user interface for this uncomplicated firewall. And if we list the configuration files for this one, only root can read or write the files and, uh, and the directory because we see that the, the directory itself is, uh, uh, is limited. Then we have uh, configuration files profiles and whatnot that are in there. Uh, but everybody else can read the application profiles, but only root can modify them. This is where we see the, the different information in, in the app profiles, right? So everybody can read the app profiles. Only root can uh, modify them. And root can also modify the different, uh, different main, uh, main profiles as, uh, as mentioned before. Now, in Unix, there's this additional hammer, like an interesting exception on how you can escape the, or, or gain additional privileges. And this is set user ID and set group ID. These are like two magic commands that allow you to elevate your privileges. So if a program has the set UID bit set, it will be run with the permissions of the owner of the file instead of the permissions of the user running the program. So usually on a Unix system, if you start a program, the program inherits the user ID of the user, right? So the user ID, the, the Linux kernel or the Unix kernel will remember, the, the user X started this process, therefore the process is owned by user X. Now if the process is, uh, has a set UID bit set, the process, if it start by an, uh, started by another user, the process will get the privileges of the user as that is being marked. So it's like a, a way to elevate for individual programs the access rights. Now for example here, um, 
we, we show two files. I list the, the contents of etc password and shadow. Um, password contains the list of all users. Shadow contains the hashed passwords of the, the users. Now, if we list these files, uh, they are owned by root and uh, readable, like password is readable by anyone. Uh, shadow is readable only by root and shadow, by these two users. Now, if we check user bin password, um, it's set as suid root, which means any user can run it because it's rx, right? Any user can run it, but only root can modify it. Of course, otherwise the user could just change the code. But any user can run it, and when any user runs it, the program runs as root on behalf of this user, which means that you can type and change your password, uh, but if you execute the, the password program, it runs as root for you and therefore has access to the uh, etc shadow file and can, for example, update the, uh, your hash. If you're for changing your password, you need to update the hash, right? This is what the uh, set UID is, uh, is here for. And that group ID allows you to run as a certain group, thereby get the, the access permission for that. Um, so when user chain runs the program password, the process is run as root, and we see here that it's running as root on behalf of, of chain. Uh, set GID does the same for groups. Group of the process running the program is set to the group of the owner of the program. Um, Set UID and set GID is displayed as S instead of X in the access right to just signal that this is the, the case. Now, uh, finding files that have the set UID bit set is fairly easy. We just find perm blah, 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 and we can, uh, we can search for it on all the system. And it's, for example, uh, user mount, mount, su, mount, ping, and whatnot. Um, why do you think ping needs to have the uh, the suite bit set. Why is ping running as root? You know what ping is? Who does not know what ping is? A few? Okay, cool. So ping is a program to, uh, it sends an ICMP message over the network. It's defined in the, uh, in the IP protocol suite. Uh, so in, in IP, you can have uh, different kind of, of messages. ICMP messages are one type of, uh, different kind of type packets. ICMP is one type of packet. Uh, ping is you are sending a packet to another host, uh, and the host returns the same uh, packet as a, as a response. Um, why would you use this? What, do you, what would you use this for? Yeah. Say again? No, maybe. So you get latency, right? Latency is a side effect. What's the main use why this is, uh, why would you use this? Yeah? This is not for ports, but close. Test the connectivity. Even shorter? If the system is up, right? Does the other server, is the server running or not? Right, if it doesn't respond to ping, it's not running. If it is running, as a side effect, you get latency, uh, or latency information, right? Yeah, um, why, would, why does this need to run as root? Just because we have to use uh, raw IP packets, which is not safe. Yes. Yeah, so because you're sending a raw IP packet, essentially. Now, the, it's a bit of uh, a historic issue because now a network card, you can buy a network card. But before, um, like in the 80s when this was designed, the idea was that network access was privileged. Like network access was uh, the trusted because uh, network cards were trusted. Therefore, running raw, like, to create such an ICMP packet, you, ha you need raw access to the network. Therefore, the assumption was that to, uh, as network access was privileged, you need to be root to be able to do that. Uh, therefore, ping only creates a certain kind of message uh, and not arbitrary raw messages. Uh, today, like, uh, I can be root on this machine, 
right? Therefore, I can create arbitrary network packets. It's no longer as, uh, as important because the, the access primitives have changed. Before, you got access as a user on a, uh, on a server, right? You were not root. Like in the, in the 80s and 90s, you were not root. You were not able to send raw network packets. Now I can buy 50 Raspberry Pis and be root on all of them and send weird packets all around, right? Um, which is very different. So it's a slight, uh, slight change. Um, so SetUD is extremely practical. It allows unprivileged users to execute some well-defined unprivileged actions. Um, SetUID can be very dangerous. Why? What's the, what's the main risk of SetUID programs? I'm going to pick you. Yeah? If there's a vulnerability in the program that can be executed this way, it may allow to uh, Right. Any bugs are fatal, correct. Like uh, a set UID program runs privileged. Any bug in a set UID, like otherwise, like if, if I'm a normal user, I run a program, the, the program runs as me. And a bug in a program just allows me, if I exploit a bug in a program, it just allows me to exploit from me to me. Like there's no benefit. Uh, but if the program runs as root and there's a bug and I control the input to it, I become root. Right? Or whatever user the set UID was set to. So these programs are privileged and any bugs are fatal. Cool. Um, in addition to access control lists, we also have capabilities in Linux. This is a recent addition, with recent being uh, about 15 years uh, old, uh, where they add additional capabilities. And remember that this is more fine-grained and allows us to decide on a per, uh, per object, right, and not on a per subject. The ACLs were on subjects as in individual users. Now capabilities we can attach on objects, for example, individual programs. So these are permissions that are related, uh, sorry, the other way around, to a subject, not, a, not an object. Linux supports capabilities for processes, whereas uh, like we can attach um, a capability to a, a running process, for example, uh, capability shown, uh, change owner, this, this, this process is allowed to make arbitrary changes to file, user ID, group ID, and whatnot, uh, DAC override, which bypasses file read, write, and execute permission checks. It's like a, a carte blanche uh, for access. Uh, Capsys boot uh, uses reboot or kexec to load a new kernel. Um, also, one program that you may have been using, uh, Wireshark, um, to sniff network traffic. So, uh, dump cap is a capability that we can attach to um, sorry, net, net, raw network access is a cap capability we can attach to this helper program called DumpCap, which then can um, orchestrate its, its access controls to make sure that anybody in the Wireshark group can actually run and read raw network traffic. Now, instead of running DumpCap as root, right, to get raw network access, we usually need root, but we don't need all the root privileges. We only need access to raw network interfaces. So dump cap uh, only gets access to raw network as a capability, raw network access as a capability. And it doesn't have to set UID bit set, right? So we don't need the set UID bit set and we can limit the amount of capabilities that dump cap gets. What happens if you have a, a bug in dump cap? Right, if dump cap uh, only has access to the, to the network, uh, network cards, to network traffic. We cannot become root, but uh, we can read raw network traffic, which is precisely the, the main functionality of dump cap, right? because we, we already have that, so we don't gain additional priv privileges. So we're executing a privileged function using the dump cap tool 
without having the ability, if there is a bug in there, to escalate our, our privileges for, further. So this is following the principle of, uh, of least privileges. So if you check the, the capabilities of dump cap, uh, sudo get cap, this is again a privileged function where you need root to actually check because otherwise you don't, you don't want to do that. Uh, you don't want to let everybody to check that. And then it says dump cap equals cup net admin. So it has network uh, privileges and network raw uh, access. Uh, so you can read and write to all network interfaces. Uh, so the program can do this while running in the name of the user. So if you run uh, dump cap, uh, PSAF, EF grab dump cap, it shows that the user has access to uh, the network interface, but the program only runs as user and not as root. Now with net admin, the user could reconfigure the, the network interface. So the worst case that happens, uh, the user could turn off networking, right, with these, uh, with these privileges but they can likely do that anyway. Uh, much safer than set UID. So if there's a bug in dump cap, uh, set UID uh, would allow an attacker to run these commands as root. Now, let's summarize this a bit for discretionary access control. It's very flexible, it's intuitive, it's easy to manage. Um, we can have access control lists and capabilities uh, attaching it to them. It's the user's responsibility. The cons are, depends on the owner's judgment. Only works if programs are benign and users make no mistakes. Um, and it's vulnerable to a, to a declassification program where a malicious program run by an authorized user can read a protected file and then write unprotected copy of that file. Um, so like uh, confused deputy style uh, attacks. But we'll, we'll get into those a bit later in the, in the class. Um, mandatory access control is more centrally managed, tries to ensure that even someone with access cannot leak the data, and it's historically been used in, uh, in the, the military for military-grade information security. Uh, this is where the idea of multi-level security comes from. You've got unclassified, confidential, secret, top secret, and as many intermediate steps as you can imagine. And then the system labels subjects and objects with security labels. Uh, so you've got somebody with uh, top secret access and they can, for example, read uh, to and write top secret files and read secret, confidential and unclassified files. Somebody with the access permission secret can read and write secret files and access confidential and unclassified information. Um, why would somebody with access rights secrets not be allowed to write confidential information. Yeah? To avoid declassification. Yeah, to avoid declassification. Right? If this person were malicious, right, imagine somebody trying to leak information uh, in the, with the rank of secret, they could read secret information, and if they can write um, unclassified or, or cla confidential information, they could create a new file with the secret information. So this prohibits leaks, um, in theory at least. So it depends on trusted software and admins for keeping the system in a protected state and by preventing operations that violate the rules of this matrix. Uh, this can be used in conjunction with uh, discretionary access control or role-based access control. Um, I think we've covered this just now, and it's also called, uh, as a summary, the no write down problem uh, to protect against declassification. So if you consider MAC and uh, confidentiality, mandatory access control and confidentiality, when protecting confidentiality, we don't want users to write to a lower level, which is summarized as no write down and this prevents leaking information from higher to lower levels. Uh, so for example, network access control, uh, where we split network into zones, the internet, uh, internal and secret, and the firewall only allows data to flow from lower zones to higher zones and not the other way around. 
uh, Mac and integrity, we don't want users from lower levels to write into higher levels, as in no write up uh, prevents unauthorized modification of objects. Right, so you want to limit somebody who has unclassified access for writing uh, classified files because this could inject different kind of files. Now you're seeing that if you combine no write down and no write up, you end up with users only being able to read and access at the, the same level. So this is very, very limited from, from, that, uh, from that regard, uh, which is why this is more a theoretical exercise uh, and used by the military than others. <coughs> Um, if you look at Mac and Linux, uh, so Linux contains two aspects, SE Linux and AppArmor, which are policies, mandatory access control policies for, uh, for different Linux systems, and they can be used uh, they are based on Linux security modules and uh, can enforce additional security checks. So, for example, with App Armor, you can specify what kind of system calls are allowed for a given process, thereby limiting their, their access control and whatnot. Uh, so, for SE Linux, every user ha has a context made of name, role, domain. Uh, files, ports, and other objects can be labeled with name, role, and type. And then SE Linux. Uh, can enforce different kind of, uh, of limitations and separation. For example, uh, Android uses SE Linux to isolate uh, apps and generic services, ensuring that apps cannot just talk to other apps, but have to follow certain access, uh, access control mechanisms, such as going through the binder service to communicate with other applications or services. So SE Linux is a uh, is used by Android internally to enforce uh, isolation between general purpose applications. Uh, AppArmor is also based on Linux security modules, um, uses profiles to, find, to define access rights to files, network and capabilities, uh, no labels or security levels, but it, it pretty much defines uh, different kind of access, uh, access policies. So, um, for example, uh, Evans is a, is a standard PDF reader. Uh, it has access control restrictions to different files and directories. So for example, it's forbidden from reading .ssh. The assumption here is that there's likely no PDF files in .ssh, which is the user directory. Uh, therefore, we're restricting this program from accessing any sensitive data because likely a PDF file uh, could be buggy and is a common attack vector. Now the reasoning here is that we are doing with app armor, <coughs> we are creating per application profiles and per application limitations. The, the default uh, Unix philosophy was originally that any application running on behalf of the user has access to all the files of the user. And with App Armor, we are now restricting the files, uh, for, example, for example, the files that an application can access. And we're saying that uh, a PDF reader should never access any files in the, in the .ssh directory, such as your, your private, uh, private key or authorized keys. Good. Um, Mac pros and cons, uh, so it addresses the limitations of discretionary access control. It's easy to scale, uh, can be too restrictive though, and uh, prevent legitimate tasks, uh, and it's not very flexible. So to summarize access control, there's different types, role-based access control, discretionary access control, mandatory access control. Uh, usage depends on the situation, what you want to achieve. And the goal is to always enforce least privilege with minimal complexity. So if you have to decide which one to use, the goal is to minimize the underlying complexity. Um, a modern operating system will use all of these types. So discretionary access control, with access control lists for files and most objects. Discretionary access control with capabilities for privileged operations, such as getting raw, uh, raw network access using groups to implement role-based access control, users, admins, HR, marketing, uh, being able to access the, 
uh, CD-ROM, drive, privileged hardware, whatnot, and mandatory access control for protecting the integrity of the system. For example, restricting applications on a, on a per-user basis. Um, two more short case studies. Authentication protocols, and then we're looking at another one as well. Authentication protocols, here the idea is that sending a password over TLS is just, is just not enough because we don't want to store the password or even send the password over to the server. Um, sending password over the network is risky, as we already discussed extensively at the beginning of the, the course. Uh, and here the idea is to have some kind of standardization to save duplicated efforts to implement authentication. Um, usually authentication protocols follow a challenge response phase. Rather than sending the password to the server, the server sends a random challenge to the client. The client uses the password hash to create a response. Uh, for example, encryption or HMAC of the challenge uh, responds it, uh, response to the server and then is authenticated. Uh, here the client knows the password and the server that knows the hashes. The client sends, hello, I'm Alice. Uh, the server looks up the anti-hash of Alice, and this is the, the old Windows file system protocol. Uh, the server sends, please, this is, please Alice, here's the challenge for you. Challenge calculates the response uh, using its anti-hash, sends it over to uh, the server, and then the server is happy. Mm. Now, these old systems, these challenge response systems, are vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks where the man or the person in the middle records uh, the information before sending it to Alice, uh, before sending it to the server, and can thereby control the information that is being sent back and forth. Um, this is why usually the, the challenge um, or the, the signature of package are, uh, the packets are signed by, with a key derived from the password hash, such as an, an HMAC. So the man in the middle does not know the key and then cannot send any packets to the server on behalf of Alice, thereby protecting against this. So modern systems use some form of mutual authentication. Uh, server and client can both use a challenge and thereby authenticate each other. So newer versions of this Microsoft challenge response protocol, SMB version two, Wi-Fi, uh, WPA and WPA two and three. And, um, these protocols may be eavesdropped or suffer cracking attacks where the attacker records challenge response and then try all possible passwords. One classic system that we have looked at in the past, uh, in previous iterations of the course we had a good 10, 15 slides on Kerberos. Uh, I cut this down to two or three to make this a bit more Dige e more easily digestible uh, and for you to provide an, an idea how these authentication protocols were designed in the past. So Kerberos, who knows Kerberos first? Oh, cool. So should I skip these slides? The one third. Uh, so let, let me just give you the high level bits. Kerberos provides authentication and authorization across the network. It's, uh, tested and proven mechanism from the 80s uh, to authenticate and authorize users for different services. Uh, exclusively based on symmetric keys. This is why it doesn't scale, right? Because it uses uh, symmetric keys. Developed at MIT uh, in the 80s to manage their fleet of terminals and systems to allow students to log in into different services, uh, access printers and, and whatnot. Um, used to be a uh, was used as an authentication protocol in early Windows uh, networks. The key idea that it introduces is delegation. You authenticate once, and then you can ask for access to multiple services without needing to re-enter credentials. So you only authenticate once for your session, and then your session can be used to access multiple different services. This gives you a separation of concerns. Now today, this is very simple for us, right? I, I've, I've given you all the, the lecture today, assuming that we split authentication and access control into two different parts. But this 
wasn't the case earlier, right? Somebody had to invent this first. After it is invented, it's much easier to, to explain. But here, uh, Kerberos was pretty much the invention of the separation of concerns that one service or one system authenticates you, and then with this authentication, you can ask another system for access. And then with this access token, you can go to the third system to actually get access to provide the actual service. So this is a three-phase approach. First, you authenticate to a server, and this gives you a ticket-granting ticket, right? Magic ticket. Uh, with the ticket-granting ticket, you go to the ticket-granting server to get a service-specific ticket. So for example, you go to the authentication server and says, hello, I'm Matthias, I would like to have a, uh, a ticket for, on my behalf for later uh, authentication to other services. I get this ticket, I go to the ticket granting system, uh, server and say, hey, now I would like to print. Here's my authorization code. And then the ticket granting server gives me a code that says, Matthias, here is your code. You're allowed to authenticate yourself to the printer and then print, right? And then you can actually ask for the, for the service. And this allows us to, the, the server, the printing server now does not need to authenticate me because it trusts the ticket granting server, which validated that I am, uh, that I, I'm allowed to access the printer and the ticket uh, granting server trusts the authentication server, which knows that I am me. Right, so this is a way how we could separate the, the three concerns. So the authentication server handles authentication, user identity verification, and is issuing the ticket granting ticket uh, solely about confirming the identity. Right? This all, the authentication service only does identity. The ticket granting server then handles access control. Right? Everything like the the first one, the authentication server, handles the first part of the lecture. The ticket granting service handles the second part of the lecture. And then with the, the access control token, you can talk to the service and actually get access to the service. Beautiful idea, very nicely split into the different steps. Question? Um, there is some expiry to it. Uh, it's valid for 60 minutes. Or, or whatnot, depending on, your, on your, your level of security. So it has an inherent timeout on it, which is one of the, which used to be one of the limitations for, uh, for Kerberos, that it needs to be limited over a, a certain time frame, which on the internet was just not enough. So maybe you, you do this for 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour or something like that. Uh, and then you have to re-authenticate. But this also reduces the load, right? First off, the printer does not know does not need to know who I am, but also if I need to print multiple things, I only need to authenticate once and then can print five, five things. So, or I need to authenticate once and can get a ticket to access the printer and the network, right? So I can get a, a ticket to access the internet and print uh, a file or store something on the, uh, on the file server or whatnot. Cool. Uh, delegated authentication. So this is pretty much the, the internet child of Kerberos that is being used, uh, used today. So OAuth 2 is a, a way how Kerberos was translated to, for, the, for the internet. It's a delegated authentication mechanism for the internet um, and providers like Facebook, Google, X, Twitter can be used to authenticate and access other applications. I'm sure you've used this in the past, right? You can use services, like some, some web service, without having to create an account there explicitly. You don't have to create a username and password, but you can create an account there with your local data by logging into Facebook, Google, Axe, or, or whatever other service that provides this information. So you can log in to Pinterest uh, with Facebook or Google, and then authorize Pinterest to access your, your Facebook photos to import them onto their, their platform. Um, so remember TLS 1.2 versus 1.3. OAuth 2 is much simpler than Kerberos and kind of applies the same idea of simplifying things but uh, making it more practicable, tractable towards the, uh, the future. Uh, in OAuth, there's a, a client. Client uh, 
application that wants to use authentication and possible access to the user's data, such as Pinterest in our example, a resource server, a uh, server that, you, that has user data that client wants to use. So for example, the Facebook server containing the user's photos, authorization server, server on which the user authenticates, which can be fa the Facebook authentication server, uh, user, the owner of the account and resources on the resource server. Uh, so the user wants to log into Pinterest with his Facebook uh, account. Workflow is as follows. User uh, logs in uh, to Pinterest, uh, tries to access Pinterest, redirects to authentication service, uh, which then the user logs in with their um, Facebook credentials, gets redirected with an authentication code in four, uh, number four. Uh, user accesses the redirection um, goes through Pinterest, Pinterest sends the authentication code and the client and a secret to the authentication server. The server gets a, an access token, which then allows the users to be logged in. And then to access the app, uh, the user goes, uh, stays on, on Pinterest, requests resource with the access token that was validated, returns resource, and then shows the resource to the, to the user. Right, that way is a multi-step authentication and Pinterest does not need to know username and password, but simply gets a token on behalf of the user. Right, so Pinterest never sees your Facebook uh, password, but can create a local profile for you with the authentication token that allows it to access the, the Facebook services. Right, because you are giving it with this redirect uh, token, you're giving it access to the, uh, to the token. So client and the authentication server have a shared secret afterwards, uh, has to register with the authentication server before being able to offer the, the services we just uh, discussed in this, uh, in this short flow. Um, the secret is used when the client exchange the authentication code for an access token. Uh, OAuth 2 can be used by the browsers or in apps. Uh, uh, in an app, a redirection for authentication can be either opening the browser with the app or switching to the other app and then, then back. Um, OAuth is only, if OAuth is only used for logging in, then the flow can stop after message eight, right? So if it's only used for logging in and authentication, you only need the flows up to step eight. If you also want to access information by the server, you need to follow the full uh, 12, 11 steps. Um, now, when you change your password, you don't necessarily need to type in your not new password on all devices because the token may still, still, be, uh, still be valid, depending on the timeout um, for the tokens. And usually timeouts are on the, of the OAuth tokens are on the order of months, right? Uh, if you think about it, how often do you have to re-log in to, to Facebook or X or whatever other uh, system you're, you're looking at? Summarizing uh, authentication, passwords can go a long way. They're still very actively used. Uh, especially if you use a password manager, you can simplify the handling of passwords for critical accounts, second factor, uh, massively raises the bar for attackers because they need to compromise multiple factors. Uh, universal, second factor, secure and user-friendly. Uh, challenge response protocols are here to authenticate a user without sending the password. We've gone through a couple uh, highlighting man in the middle uh, issues uh, or threats and how to, to mitigate them. Uh, Kerberos is an example from the 80s to authenticate users uh, across the network. Um, separating authentication from authorization uh, with a longer example on OAuth that uses it to delegate authentication on the internet. Uh, interestingly, compared to Kerberos, OAuth has no uh, mentioning of crypto except for asking that all the communication happens over a TLS secured uh, stream, right? So this delegates crypto to the uh, to the syst uh, to the rest of the, the system, like built on top of a secure communication challenge, and thereby making the protocol much easier. Um, homework: uh, You'll play with cookies for authentication and different HTTP algorithms and TOTP algorithms. 
Next lecture, we'll talk a bit more about how access control is applied to data storage. Right? There's a difference between running applications and um, storage of, uh, of, of files at the server level, application level, data level, and network level. And how can we securely store passwords such as salt, uh, using a salt or memory hard functions and whatnot, and then go for a password authenticated key exchange. Let me summarize. Access control has multiple approaches depending on the policy uh, definition. Security mechanisms prevent violations of underlying policies. Um, authentication lets subjects identify themselves as something they own, they know, or they are. And protocols let a user authenticate in a network without sending their passwords in clear text. And uh, authentication, as we've seen with Kerberos and OAuth 2, can be delegated to third parties. That's all that I have for today. Sorry for the bit of a rush uh, in the third, uh, third hour. We had two great presentations in between. Consider reaching out to the Women Plus uh, in IC and to the forum. Thank you all, and see you on Wednesday or online.